Welcome to the Tuesday, September 10th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. If you would please rise and join me in saying Pledge of Allegiance. There it is. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, do we have any adjustments to tonight's agenda? No? no. Seeing none, item two, approval of the school board minutes. May I have a motion? Mary? Um, I move that we approve the school board minutes as listed in our agenda. Second? Second. Any comments? Mm -mm. All those in favor? All right. We remember how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now, item three, comments from our new student representatives. Welcome. First of all, thank you for having us. Um, basically, it's just been the first week of school, and we've noticed that the freshmen are adjusting very well. Everybody's been very busy getting back into the regular routine, going day to day, changing classes. Um, the junior class is busy planning the upcoming homecoming, uh, homecoming and spirit week, and we also have a dance tentatively planned for October 19th, which will be the first one in three years if it does follow through. Um, not all iPads have been distributed to students yet. That is due to some confusion with insurance forms and just con general confusion as to when you can receive your iPads. I personally helped with the distribution of the iPads for the freshmen and it didn't go quite as smoothly as it could have, so possibly next year we could develop a new plan for that distribution. Okay, hi, I'm Tim Hartel and I'm a senior, and as a senior, uh, and the entire senior class is nervous and excited for the whole college application process. Ms. Nell has been exceptionally helpful with the new Common App and with helping to revise essays. The entire process has been really eased by the guidance department's stellar assistance. Um, also, the Freshling program is going off without a hitch, and the freshmen seem to be really adapting well to the high school climate. Um, the transition from school to summer has been going really well, except for, as Sierra said earlier, the whole iPad retrieval process, which has been kind of confused and uh, a little bit slow this year. But aside from that, everything's going well. And also, one more thing. Um, Maine's highest court, the Supreme uh, Judicial Court, will be holding three actual hearings in the Cape Elizabeth High School Auditorium on October 9th. Uh, these hearings will uh, be at 8.55, 9.55, and 10.55. If you can make it, we would love to have the school board members attend one or more of these hearings. Um, all students in the grades 10, 11, and 12 um, will see at least one of these hearings, and students taking AP government will see all three, and will have the opportunity to join all the seven of the court's ju uh, justices for lunch after the hearings. Uh, teachers will prepare students in advance of hearings based on materials that the court provides so students will be able to follow the arguments presented and this session is part of the court's outreach system and each year the court holds hearings in three main high schools and the court coordinator in this program uh, is court administrator and former town council member uh, Mary Ann Lynch. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions for student representatives? Does, does the uh, Maine Supreme Court let you know what those cases are that will be heard? Um, I don't believe that they are going to be telling us what they are in advance. Okay. Just that they will be uh, discussing them. And are they actual cases being tried in the schools? Is that what you said? Yes, then? I believe so, yes. So there will be witnesses and... Or I think that maybe it will just be the, the discussion of the cases. Just that the have discussion. Oh, okay. Yeah. That sounds interesting. Sure. Sure. Sounds interesting. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> they will act, we will be getting information from the court. The, the Supreme Judicial Court is strictly an appeals court, so these are not trials that are happening. These are 
oral arguments um, based on trials that have been previously heard and decided, and one side or the other has appealed the decision of the lower court. Um, the court will give us um, information about the specific cases, and they'll be sending us copies of, I'm not sure if it's digested copies of the entire briefs that the lawyers on both sides have presented, and then we'll uh, work through the teachers to make sure that uh, students have um, a, pr a reasonably good understanding so that they can make sense of the arguments that are being made. Okay. Just a supplement. <laughs> Very cool. I was just going to say, if there were no other comments for student representatives while Jeff was up, I was going <laughs> to see if there was anything else he wanted to offer about opening. And, and Kelly could certainly do the same. Absolutely. Thinking. Since it's the beginning of the school year, yeah. it would be nice to hear from our administrators. So the first um, couple of weeks of high school involve um, it's what is called our ad drop period. So our students are sort of figuring out exactly where they're going to be settling for courses. We're watching section numbers and class sizes and all that sort of information. I do know that our class, our overall student population is somewhat up from what it was last year and somewhat up from what we expected it to be. Um, but we're still working through that as families notify us if, they, if they've left, even though we haven't gotten official word. Um, our high school open house is tomorrow night for high school parents. Um, so parents will follow their student schedule and meet their students' teachers and hear about the courses that they're taking. Uh, that should be a fun night. Um, I, and I think parents should be well prepped for that evening, um, talking with their students to get their schedules. Um, I do want to comment that we've had already some great senior leadership in the high school, um, accept, accepting and understanding some changes that we've made to try to make the school even more comfortable for all students um, of all grades, and that's been really great. I will say in particular that we had a wonderful senior leadership at the Friday night football game the other night, a uh, large cheering section. Um, and universally positive, energetic crowd right until the very end, even though we lost. Uh, but the fan section was just fantastic. Um, just the, and the team is in sort of rebuilding this year this year. Um, I will second uh, what Sierra and Tim have said is that we have still things to learn about getting all the iPads out uh, to students at the beginning of the year. Um, we know that. Uh, we are not pretending that it's been, it's been done perfectly, but we're learning. and. The only thing I will say is we will do it better next year than this year, but right now they're in the hands of about uh, 85 to 90 percent of our students um, and, and a much higher percentage of our freshmen, I think, is about 99 percent of our ninth graders. Um, and it's been the older students that we're sort of working through. Um, our first day of school is one that I've described as organized chaos, and hopefully we've, and it was that, maybe high on the chaos and light on the organized. Uh, from, from, from some perspectives, we try to cram in every possible disruption for the beginning of the year on the very first day. Um, and since then, I think the, the school, the students have been settling in to more of a routine. Um, just a couple of data points for you, because um, I was looking at it recently. Uh, the, the school as a whole, our juniors, who are now our seniors, um, once again scored at the <coughs> top of the state, either at or tied at the top of the state for every area measured by the SATs um, and by the science augmentation part of the mains assessment system. Um, you'll hear about that. And another um, piece of data that I am particularly proud of is that over the last couple of years, the numbers, the percentage of our students taking and successfully passing um, at least one AP exam over the course of their um, high school experience has gone up remarkably. So we're now up over 60% on that number. I don't remember the exact number, but it's gone up almost 15% over the last two years. And, my, and I'm knowing the numbers that we have right now will go up even more the next year. So I think it's a good measure of our exposure of uh, a large number of a percentage, a large percentage of our students to the most challenging uh, curriculum that we offer in the school. So that's what I have. I don't know if there are any questions about any of those things or anything else. Thank you. No, thank, thank you, you Jeff.
Good Allie. evening. Um, Pond Cove has gotten off to a fabulous start this year. Uh, last week on Tuesday, we welcomed back grades one through four, and last week went really well. And yesterday, we welcomed our kindergartners. And other than maybe in height, you really wouldn't know. It was indistinguishable how excited and ready they were for school as with their grades one through four counterparts. So that went very, very well. And I really credit the kindergarten team and the supportive parents who came last week when the students were being, when students were administered some early assessments and they took dry bus runs and it went really, really well. We had a lot of professional development done over the summer particularly with our new writing program that aligns with the Common Core from Teachers College, Lucy Calkins Units of Study. So we've been rolling that out. Teams have been working really hard with that. And we're very excited. We're going to be um, having a meeting with Kathy Collins from Teachers College tomorrow with the superintendent and um, representatives from the school. Personally, I'm delighted to have a wing woman this year with our new assistant principal, Julie Nickerson, and that's going really, really well, And uh, as uh, in addition to our new staff that have joined us. And we are welcoming Stan Davis uh, next Monday, thanks to a very generous grant from the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation. And he, as you um, may recall, is the author and counselor and anti-bullying expert. And because of SEAF, we're going to be working with him throughout the school year. We Skyped with him today, um, Julie Nickerson, school counselor Bree Gallagher and I, and uh, to plan out everything. And um, he's excited, we're excited. And um, the Skyping is all part and parcel of the, of the grant. And we're really, really excited um, that he'll be coming. We are um, having him also present to parents uh, Monday night at 6.30 in our media center. It was originally going to be in the cafetorium. I'll put out a change in that, but it will be in the media center. And his topic will be getting your child ready for returning to school and life, is what he's calling it. And so it will kind of be a rollout of what our new school action plan with, that we're calling Peaceful Pond Cove is going to be with, with his, in partnership with his work. So we're excited. You're all invited to attend. And um, many of you um, are parents anyway at the school. So we hope that we have, we, we're expecting large attendance. So does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Okay. We're off to a great start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, on to item four, comments from the public on agenda items. Oh, seeing no members of the public, we'll move on to item five, communications. Will you indulge and me and let me flip the order so that I don't have to bounce off the screen? Yes. For a moment? Okay. Yes. You may flip the order. We'll start with item B, the superintendent's report. Perfect. Uh, John, we do have two members of the public out there. I... Do you want them to speak? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I have this. <laughs> so, as you've heard from multiple folks, it's the opening of the school year, and I want to say a special thanks to our facilities and maintenance employees across the district. Um, we were able to open the year with facilities in great shape, and that's in spite of a number of projects that were completed this summer. Um, so down to the wire in some cases, but folks um, worked collaboratively to get everything ready. It was a really positive opening day for employees across the district. We have a gathering at the high school traditionally where we bring all the staff together across the district and we recognize staff for their anniversary years. Just to note that there's a lot of longevity in this district and we recognized um, three people with 25 years of experience, two people who um, reached the 30 year mark and five people who have more than 30 years of experience at the district. And I wanna just single out the top most senior employee at the di in the district who is Andrea Kayer at the high school, um, who has been in the district for 38 years uh, as a high school teacher. Um, <laughs> we also, um, on that day, CIF, um, the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, presents awards to um, some faculty in the district and high school social worker Pam Vos received <coughs> the Tim Thompson Award, and Pond Cove librarian Cameron Rosenblum received the Elaine Brunell Award. Um, as you've heard, our IT staff was also really busy um, this summer. We have um, iPads now at our middle school, so one-to-one -one for all of our seventh and eighth graders. And we also have, um, for the second full year, one-to-one -one iPads for all of our high school students. And with the changes in the MILTI program, there are now two devices per teacher at our middle school and high school. So 
um, as well as some changes in how apps are deployed and, and some of those things. So a lot of transitions for our IT staff and um, as Jeff pointed out, some of that's been a little bumpy, not from a lack of effort, um, but it really is a challenge to manage that number of devices um, in a pretty short window of time. Seventh and eighth graders will be receiving their iPads next week, I believe. The open house for parents are scheduled for Monday and Tuesday. Uh, transportation, our bus runs seem to be working. Um, you know, as always at the beginning of the year, we are sort of troubleshooting as we go. Um, and our transportation department is really responsive to those phone calls and um, we do our best to make those adjustments. We keep a spare driver available in case we have excess ridership at particular stops. And um, so far, we see it seems to be working out for us, but we always keep an eye on those for the first couple weeks. Um, enrollment, again, you've heard, um, few changes there. Our total district, en en district enrollment is only two students fewer than what we had last year. Um, we projected that we would be down about 24 students, so that didn't happen. It's pretty flat. Um, Pond Cove welcomed about 50 new students. About 30 new students arrived at the middle school and about 15 at the high school. So again, some students left, but you can imagine what it takes to register 50 new students mm -hmm. at the elementary level and to make sure all that paperwork is complete before school opens. Um, so Pond Cove had 16 more students than we had projected. The middle school had 19 more students than we had projected. And my numbers say the high school was down um, about 10 students. But um, again, as Jeff pointed out, it's early for us. These are really preliminary enrollment numbers. We report our enrollment to the state on October 1st. So. Um, we also monitor where we are within class size guidelines. So at K2, all of our classes fall within the guidelines. Um, at grade three and four, we have a couple of classes that are at 23 students um, above the recommended 22. At um, the middle school, all grades five through eight have um, a few classes that are at 23 and one or two that are at 24. And as Jeff said, it's still the add drop period at the high school, so they're still monitoring that, but we're keeping our eye in particular on um, AP Biology, a couple of advanced algebra classes, Latin, and um, there are a few others. <coughs> we'll keep you posted on that. You can expect an update at our next meeting. Um, we are offering world language to our second graders this year for the first time, so they have two 30-minute classes a week. Um, it's the year for French, so all of our second graders are practicing their French language skills, which is very exciting. Um, and at the end of September, we expect the information to be coming home soon, we'll be offering an after-school exploratory Mandarin Chinese program um, for middle school students in partnership with the University of Southern Maine's Confucius Institute, which is launching for the first time this year. So um, again, you should expect to see if you're a parent of a middle schooler that information coming home soon. Um, Kelly mentioned the work with Stan Davis that's going on at Pond Cove around um, school climate and bullying. And um, the middle school and high school will also be working, um, as you've heard before, with Steve Wessler this year on, that, on those same issues. So there's a lot of overlap. Upcoming open houses. Our middle school principal isn't with us tonight because he is at the fifth and sixth grade open house. Seventh and eighth grade open house will be this Thursday. Pond Cove uh, is on the 26th, as is senior parent night. The high school already had um, open house for ninth graders. I think sophomores are tomorrow night and juniors. <laughs> if you are a parent of a junior, check the calendar. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and we'll give you some more detail also at your next meeting on all of the professional development work that occurred this summer. We're still collecting back some of the reports on those, so we'll give you an updated report on that, as well as lay out for you some of the work that's happening this school year um, as that's, those dates and um, projects are being finalized. I think that is due to that. Thank you. So we move on then to this strategic plan Perfect. presentation and, and <laughs> Look at this. You don't have to get up and I walk around. I don't have and... to get up. <laughs> there are perks to everything. Let's see. You might wish I did. Okay. So, it's a little fuzzy. I'm going to get up anyway. I mean, we'll have the ring. Okay. 
Yes. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so, this you may recognize is our vision and mission statement. And um, it also captures the values that we developed through a collaborative planning process and that were adopted by the board um, in May of 2012, which led us to the work of the Strategic Planning Committee. Um, a lot of the things that emerged during the strategic planning work were reflected in the mission, vision, and mission, I blend those words all the time, mission, vision, and values um, that, are, that you saw on the previous slide, but I think it's interesting sometimes to see those words all popping out together. <laughs> As we looked at the strategic planning work, the work really broke down into four goal areas, three that are organized primarily around those um, values, community, academics, passion, and ethics. And goal one um, is to ensure opportunities for the success of all students by providing a high quality and comprehensive instructional program. So this is the fundamental work of schools, as, as most people think about it. Um, that's our job. We're trying to educate them, to help them get what they need, um, a comprehensive program so that they have multiple options. Things that we've talked about here as a board in the past are narrowing the achievement gap for our vulnerable cohort groups. Right now, we know that those groups in our district are our students with disabilities who typically underperform in comparison to their um, non-identified peers, as well as our students with, um, who are considered socioeconomically disadvantaged locally. In addition, we want to make sure that our curriculum is well articulated and coordinated K-12. Um, and I know that's a topic that the school board has discussed in the past as we've looked at sort of vertical alignment and transition. That work will be continuing and the addition of a um, curriculum person at the district office level I think will be um, a real benefit to accomplishing some of this work. But note that it also says that we want to make sure we're embedding 21st century skills and knowledge and meeting learning standards established by the state of Maine. Um, in many cases, we exceed the learning standards established by the state of Maine, but every student should be able to meet them. And that, that again, is part of our fundamental work. Third, related to that, you see um, that we've, say we, we say we want to develop a standards-based assessment and reporting system that profiles the educational skills, passions, and needs of all Cape Elizabeth students. I think that again reflects the commitment to looking at the whole child, not simply looking at how they perform in the academic domains or the traditional academic domains that are measured by standardized assessments, reading and mathematics particularly, um, but at what matters to this child, what are their interests, what are their needs, do they need to build their communication skills and their public speaking skills, do they need to um, work on their ability or willingness to take risks in, in an academic setting and volunteer information. Can I, can I interrupt Please. and ask a question? So uh, Dr. Tracy mentioned standards-based assessments as well in his um, speech to middle school parents this evening. And that, that's an education industry yes. buzzword. Thank you. If you could give us a primer on what, what we mean when we say sure. standards-based assessments. That so um, the traditional grading system that many of us grew up in is A, B, C, D, F. And that is great at sort of articulating perhaps how you might be doing in relation to your peers, but it doesn't necessarily provide information about what skills you have or what skills you may need to develop. So a standards-based system will say, John <laughs> can decode multi-syllable words. Um, he can... Most of the time. <laughs> he uses correct spelling at an appropriate level. He is solving multi-digit addition and subtraction problems. And um, he has great mathematical thinking and problem solving skills. Those are standards based kind of that pieces of information as opposed to John's a B student. Which is a matter of assessing everybody and then placing them somewhere on a bell curve and the middle of the road is just the middle of the pool of students that you happen to have. Well, hopefully not a bell curve. <laughs> Some kind of curve. That's the traditional system. So. Okay, and, thank you. And the state has um, 
made it a requirement that students graduating from high school effective 2018 need to be um, graduating in a proficiency-based environment, so demonstrating that they're meeting these particular standards. Not that they are earning A, B, Cs, or Ds, but that they are demonstrating the skills. Thanks. I should mention, incidentally, that this is a five-year plan, and you'll see the timeline as we get <laughs> a little further. And this is the big picture view, so I'll come back to that. Um, goal two, expand learning opportunities for all students by cultivating an inclusive and supportive district culture. You heard a little bit about some of the climate and culture work that's been going on in our schools. In addition, if you, well, I can go back to that slide quickly, but if you look at this slide, the biggest word out there is community. Um, so what we want to do is make sure we're strengthening community connections. And community is internal as well as external, but we want to develop and sustain partnerships with people within our community, businesses within our community, organizations within our community, as well as those outside of our community to reinforce the learning of those 21st century skills. Um, and in materials that you receive, which are not yet published online, but will be tomorrow. Um, there's a link to a 21st century skills document that articulates what, what we think of as 21st century skills. And they are the creative problem solving, critical thinking, communication skills, those kinds of skills that we know um, are important in a changing, um, changing environment. B, support the development of the traits of personal integrity, empathy, responsibility, respect for self and others, perseverance, independence, and collaboration. Again, those were um, pieces drawn directly from the values statements and from the mission and vision. And uh, again, it's that emphasis on recognizing the whole child. And C, wanted to say three, but expand students' understanding of global culture, cultures, and issues. Um, you know, the, the expansion that I mentioned of world language at second grade, the offering of um, Ch Mandarin Chinese for students to explore in the middle level are um, examples of the kind of activities you may see or action steps you may see um, for any of these objectives, but particularly for that one. Goal three, and this is a big one, um, increase student engagement in learning and teacher engagement in instruction. And again, this was a, a major topic and theme across all stakeholders from parents and community members and students and um, one that we think is really important. So one objective you see there, and again the link to this will be in the published document when it's online, but increase the district's flexibility to transform the educational experience for students by becoming an innovative school district. Um, the state established a law a couple of years ago saying that districts can declare themselves innovative school districts um, by presenting a plan to the Department of Education. And that plan will allow you to say, gosh, you know, we like that you say the school year is 175 days, but we'd rather do 166 days because we want to build in some more professional development or we want to have some other types of activities for students outside of a traditional school calendar or it would allow us to push back on state rules that say your graduation requirements can only be met by you know, X, Y, and Z. And we wanna say, well, we're still gonna meet those standards requirements, but we wanna do it in a slightly different way. So it allows us the flexibility to determine locally how to best meet the needs of students in Cape Elizabeth. Um, B, provide a variety of options for students to become college and career ready. Again, this speaks to the fact that for some students, and particularly at the upper middle and high school level, um, traditional course offerings don't always, aren't always the best fit. So we want to look at other ways for students to potentially earn, um, meet the requirements, meet the standards, show that they're demonstrating their proficiencies, and still allow them to graduate. Um, an example might be a student does an internship in a science laboratory um, and still meets the chemistry standards, for example. I could, there could be many. Um, and C, provide a variety of options for teachers to grow professionally that are connected to both individual and district goals. So again, recognizing that our teachers are individuals as well, and we want to be affording them the same opportunity to grow um, as professionals. Goal four. And this one I, I said, I think it's critical to be in any strategic plan because it's the resource issue. Um, but goal four is very simply to align the district budget with strategic plan goals and to target resources accordingly. 
And one objective that we'll actually talk about later this evening is adopting a multi-year capital improvements plan for the district. So as I said, this was, that's kind of the broad brush of here are the targets. But this is a five-year plan. Five years seems a long, it's a long time away, uh, but that would take us to 2018. In August of 2013, this draft that I've just presented was shared with administration and faculty and a draft was given to the school board. Now, September, we're sharing it um, in this format initially with parents and the community. It will also be shared, disseminated through um, school newsletters to parents, um, and it will be the focus of the school board workshop on September 24th. So that's an opportunity for us to really dig into that, ask more questions, flesh it out a bit. Um, in October, with any luck, we'll be able to adopt sort of the big picture goals and objectives, and again, disseminate that information that this is now the adopted plan, and um, packaged in such a way that people understand, here's where this came from, Here's the data and research that supports um, some of this work. In January, and the administrators are already working on this with faculty in their buildings, but in January we would present some short and long-term action steps and measurable targets for those objectives um, to you as a board. And then we would be giving you progress reports at least twice a year between now and, bless me, 2018. <laughs> um, on, on how the work is going towards those strategic plan goals and objectives. And so by no means does what you see here outline every single thing that's going to be happening in the district related to these goals, but I think what it does do is encapsulate the direction um, that the district is trying to move in or that the community has articulated as a direction that it would like to see the district move in. And then the people within our schools are going to be helping to spell out exactly how we're going to get there. So we'll have an opportunity at our workshop to discuss this in more detail, but if people have questions now, now is a good time. Sure. Meredith, um, if you could just comment, I know a big uh, re request from citizens has, has been, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, benchmarking it in objectives. So, um, you know, maybe someone's seen the broader goals and objectives. Uh, maybe if you could just peel back the onion a little bit. In, in January 2014, um, would you envision for each objective there, uh, for those that are more measurable, you know, there's very specific targets so we can hold ourselves accountable, stakeholders will know how we're progressing. Yes, I would. <laughs> and, and again, January may feel like a long time away, but, um, but it's right around the corner for us and, and I think it's important for um, faculty and, and folks within the building to have an opportunity to help really flesh out what are those targets and what's achievable. I mean, there's professional development work that's tied to some of this. There's work with students that's going to be occurring along the way. But I think it's realistic to expect that there'll be measurable targets. And um, again, and some of those are the action step itself may be the measurable target, um, but others will be measurement pieces that you can expect to see. Great, thank you. David? Um, Three questions. One is um, this whole concept of innovative school district seems to be allowing us flexibility to design a curriculum and school day and terms and everything to what we think is best. How does this align with the common core standards, which I assume we're ultimately going to follow in the state, which I actually think more I read among are excellent. I mean, we're not going to, we wouldn't use that to modify the common core, I mean, maybe to implement it better or differently. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, right now I'm not sure where the state's going to be standing with the Common Core, to be frank, David, but again, it, but we it's can still going do to it allow even us. The state says we don't have to. Yes, we can. And we're already, we've already been doing work uh, on the Common Core. So, yeah, the, the idea isn't to throw out the things that are good or great. The idea is to really examine each thing carefully and to think about what makes the most sense for us locally. You know, I, 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 I think you would hear from most folks here that the Common Core has great information in it um, and that we don't disagree with those standards. In some cases, our local standards are higher than some of the Common Core expectations, right. but not across the board. Um, I guess I only have two questions. I'll shorten it to okay. two. Um, just when you say goal four, you said the objective was to adopt a multi 
if we're going to make an innovative school district, it's going to involve probably, but potentially more money than simply a capital improvement plan. Mm -hmm. So it's, if our objective is to align our school budget, it's going to be more than bricks and mortars. It's going to be other things. So I would just suggest. It is. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I mean, I think the, we do a budget annually, and to say align the budget, and then to say under objectives, I don't disagree with you. I'm open to suggestions in that, and I think that would be a great thing uh, to discuss at the workshop. Right, but I, I would, agree. I there would just suggest a, a, a B to that about Perfect. our operating budget. Perfect. Um, in terms of becoming an innovative school district, can you at the workshop provide us with more information about, um, you know, sort of what that looks like and um, how you become one and what sort of leeway that will give us and uh, what sort of programs we might be able to add? Absolutely. Um, the statutory information in terms of what the law says by itself was included in your packet and will be posted online. But mm -hmm. to break that down and talk about in yeah. practical terms what that might look like, we'll definitely share with you. Um, and, and part of the answer is, I don't know all of the components of that yet. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I think that's part of the journey um, as we do this work together is what are we going to bump into that's getting in the way of our ability to best meet the needs of our learners here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I think that's part of the conversation that's going to be happening, you know, in each school as well as at the district level. Okay. But I will definitely be able to share some examples. That's great. And do you think that will be a way that we can sort of um, backdoor efforts in, or maybe front door efforts into really improving that cohort group that we're concerned about if we can look at experiential learning, for instance, for that group? Exactly. I think it gives us Target. flexibility to determine how we can best meet the needs of those students, right. of all of our students. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so the, the, the work that's been done on this, of course, is done, you know, was begun by the, the, the group of stakeholders who, looked, who worked on the mission and vision and then a, a different group of, of stakeholders, community members, parents, teachers, and students who worked on the who worked specifically on the development of the strategic plan, which is, so it's, this is expressing, you know, broad goals that that group, through the work that they did with an even larger group, were able to um, condense into, into these four goals. Right. Um, but the idea is that the, you know, now the work goes out to the buildings, um, to each of the schools, where the, 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 the people who would be involved in implementing um, any of the ideas that come forward, put those ideas forward, such that they're consistent with, our, with the goals, the broad goals that have been identified. Um, and so I, one of the things about the innovative school, to my mind, is it, it frees people to think um, creatively about how we might approach things and unshackles us from the concept that the state the, 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 the state regulations are preventing us from doing what we'd really like to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we don't necessarily know exactly, you know, at this point, until that work is done and, and, and presented to the board in January, we don't know exactly what those things might be. Yeah. But it's liberating, to my mind. Yeah, I would say, as someone who worked on the mission and vision for several months, this is, uh, I'm very pleased at this. I mean, I think it's it's an organic next step. So I'll be very interested to it's coming along um, exactly as I would have expected and hoped. And thank you to all of you who put in the time to to work on this because it's it's exciting. It's a very exciting. Um, there's exciting potential in each one of these goals. I think. Any more questions or comments? John, um, yes. It's, this is huge. Like this is this is great. This is like doctorate material. Like it's huge, and the work that the administration and the team already. <laughs> Should have used that. No, I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> um, the I know how hard our administration um, and teachers already work, and the limited time and and all. How are you doing on that side? Of I know we have the budget, um, but how are we doing on managing? The think tank versus the real right. work. 
I mean, I think we're at a work, point, but this this type this no, side of the. But work. I think we're at a point, and you know, there are members of the administrative team here who can certainly speak to this. But I think we're at a point where this is the real work. Okay. You know, now we're at a point where we're moving these pieces forward in our schools, and it's not all new work. It's not all different work. It's work that has been coming together. And it, I, my feeling is we're sort of at a point where the arrows now are all pointing Great. in the same direction. Um, so. so you have enough support is the other piece. Um, I guess I'd love to hear along the way mm -hmm. how that's going and, you know, I know fire drills can get in the way of meetings and sure. other things can happen, but I'd just like to make sure that the, you guys have support for this work. And I think that's a great question to raise at the workshop as well so that they'll all be there and able to provide the answer to that question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, on to item six, new business, 6A. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the proposed World Affairs Council Model UN trip to Brown University on November 8th through 10th, 2013. Second. Uh, any discussion? I'll just note that this is um, a fairly traditional trip for students at the high school level. It's not a new request. Um, it's the same advisor who has led this trip in, um, at least since I've been here, and happy to, we're happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? All those in favor? Uh, B, item B, may I have a motion? I move that we approve the proposed Cape Elizabeth High School debate team trip to Yale University, September 20th through 22nd, 2013. Second. Thank you. Uh, any, yes. Just one note on this one. It says in your materials that it will be parent-driven vans. It actually, we are using the school van, so it will be driven by the faculty chaperone, um, not by parents. I have one question. Couldn't we do better than Yale University? How about Oxford? That's what item 6A was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nobody will get that. that, but you will. All right. Watching it home. <laughs> Brown. This may have something yeah. to do with alma mater. Um, <laughs> is there any other discussion? <laughs> any real discussion? Ouch. <laughs> All those in favor? All right, 6-0. Michael's is out. Uh, item C, Joe. I move that we approve the uh, athletic and co-curricular staff nominations as listed out in item 6C in tonight's agenda with the addition of Kim Sturgeon as the mentor for Stephanie Buffard, which was missing from the original agenda materials. Uh, second. Elizabeth. Any discussion? David. Well, uh, I'd just like to modify the motion. When we're, in addition to approving nominations, we're off pr approving what we're paying them. And that's not stated in the motion. We're approving the persons and what they are being paid for the task that is listed in here. So we're approving the nomination of a person and their stipend. And their stipend. Would you like me to restate? Yes, please. I would be glad to. <laughs> I move that we approve the following athletic and co-curricular staff nominations and their associated stipends with the addition of Kim Sturgeon as the mentor for Stephanie Buffard as laid out in our agenda in item 6C for this evening. Second it. I second. Still seconded. Any discussion on the revised motion? David? Yes, I, I studied this fairly carefully and I have a variety of concerns um, which might normally cause me to uh, vote against this, but as uh, we start in the school year, people, these are great programs, we need to continue them, I, I, I will vote in favor of it, but my concerns arise from the fact that it is just, having looked at this in the various positions, it, it, it just seemed that there were some fairly significant inequities. By inequities, I mean inconsistencies, things that didn't make sense between, and it would seem to be driven by the fact that we have a, a payment system that has a flat rate and then 
hours, and the hours assigned to certain tasks, to me, did not seem to correspond necessarily to the amount of work. Either it was not enough hours or it was too much hours. And sometimes you see multiple headings and therefore multiple stipends for what seemed to be an interrelated, if not overlapping, uh, position. Uh, and then when I looked into how this all evolved, I, 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 it, it turns out that we decide the rate and ultimately the stipend, but the key component, which is the number of hours as well as the uh, activity, is decided by a committee of which um, we are not in any way as near the majority of that committee. And I, I think it's something that we should consider this year that we should take this task back to the committee level, and if we have to change contracts or policy, whatever necessary to do it, and we should have more, much more control. This just for co-curricular, not mentoring, not sports, just co-curricular, it's at least 100 grand. That's a lot of money. We should have more information on how it's being spent, uh, how much is being spent, and for what. So, as I said, I looked at this, and I would normally raise, you knowing me, 20 questions about what seems to be just doesn't make, I, I just don't get it. It just doesn't seem to make sense. Some of which I know, uh, certain things I know, I know they're putting in more hours than that. Other things I don't know much about, it seems like there's an awful lot of hours. So I, I, I will support it, but um, I strongly urge that we consider moving this to a, to a school board in whatever fashion we, we do it. We have much more input and control over how this is done. Thank you. Are there any other comments? All those in favor? All right, I'm sorry, Joe. I got ahead of myself. Item six. D was a man, well, the, the one I meant to steer in your direction, Joe, so I'll steer it in your direction now. Okay, I'm on the hot seat tonight. Nice. Yes. She made every motion. Well, not the first one. And, and corrected on a motion. Hopefully I can get this one right. Okay, so I move that we, well, what would the motion actually be, David? Because it's not really for a second reading, it's an adoption at this stage. Yeah, I move that we adopt the following policies for second reading as listed out in our tonight's agenda is item 6D. And delete. And, delete. and the deletion or recommended for no changes. Is there a second? No, oh, go ahead. Okay, um, is there any discussion? No. Yeah. All those in favor? Joe? Is that a high? Okay. Yeah, I raised Okay. <laughs> All right. Item E. I was just looking forward to my next motion. Okay. <laughs> yep, the next one's yours. Thank you. I move that we approve the following policy for first reading um, GCQE enrollment of non resident employees as listed out in tonight's agenda, item 6E. Okay, there's actually no, no need for a motion on this one. Sorry, I steered you the wrong way that time. No motion. No motion. First reading. There'll be no movement. Mm -hmm. It is noted that this policy, GCQE, is, is in front of the board for first read, and if people have comments on the policy, please, um, please submit them to Joe. Or you. In advance of the next policy meeting, which is the October 7th, yes. Monday Just, before the next board meeting. Correct. David. Just to be clear for the audience, um, it's enrollment of non-resident employees' children. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a, an issue that we should have a good discussion about because it involves a lot of uh, related legal as well as practical issues. Um, uh, and it's something that I think we should weigh in on. Thank you. Uh, is there any other discussion of E? No. Okay. Item 6F. May I have a motion? Anybody? A motion. <laughs> <laughs> not Joe. Read the whole thing. No. No, not anymore. That was just your first year. <laughs> I move we authorize $88,750 lease purchase agreement for a school bus. Mm -hmm. 
I'll second. Thank you, Mary. Uh, is there any discussion? Um, I just wanted to point out that the lease agreement is attached to tonight's agenda and that Elizabeth got out of having to read it. Her baby. Yes. That's uh, noted. Is there any, are there any questions about this lease? Okay, all those in favor? Seven zero. Uh, item G. Could, could I do the motion for this one to show you how to do it exactly? Yes, right? yes. Thank you, David. And there's no ego involved in that comment. Um, no. I, I move that we authorize the 57,230 lease purchase agreement for computer equipment and related software and peripherals as set forth in the lease agreement attached to the agenda. Second. I'll well, second. Um, I do have a question. Okay. We didn't need to make the motions that were attached in our packet? No. The exact wording. No. Okay. Any other questions? No. All those in favor? Thank you. Item H, may I have a motion? Um, let's see, is that mine? H? Yes. Yes, that's mine. I, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Um, I um, move that we nominate Elizabeth Seifries, Michael Moore, and John Christie to serve as um, our board representatives to the negotiation committee. Um, and I would say, um, I would further add that that's the negotiation committee for the teacher's contract that will be coming up this spring. Is there a second? A second. Is there a comment? David? Um, I'm glad that Mary made her motion specific that that committee is for that particular contract. Yes. I, I think it would be a bit helpful, John, if you describe a little bit the slightly different process we're going to utilize this year for the, uh, about school board involvement in <coughs> assisting the negotiating committee. So every year, uh, typically every year, there's a, there is a collective bargaining group whose, whose agreement or contract uh, comes, uh, expires and has to be renegotiated. Um, this year there are two collective bargaining groups. One is the teachers group and one is the administrators group. Um, tonight we're just talking about board representatives to the, the board group that will uh, bargain on behalf of the board um, with the teachers union. Um, and um, this is, this is the, the, the teacher salary and benefits uh, in that they represent a, a, a large portion of our annual budget, this negotiation is an important negotiation to the board. Um, and we will um, be meeting as a negotiation committee um, in advance of those negotiations to talk about board goals. Um, and then we'll meet as a board uh, in advance of those neg negotiations to talk about board goals. Uh, so that we have a clear understanding of the board objectives going into those negotiations. Does that, yeah. that address what you were hoping Thank to Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, any, is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Thank you, and thank you, Michael and Elizabeth, for serving on that team. Um, item seven, uh, the, committee, the uh, Capital Improvement Committee has a report on the district capital improvement plan. Yes, so I think Michael's going to present this on behalf of the Buildings and Grounds Committee. And I, you can cue me when you want me to work through the slides. But here's the cover sheet. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I'm going to present uh, the plan for the schools, community services, and the pool. Uh, it's out of the capital, capital stewardship plan. and. Um, the Buildings and Grounds Committee was composed of uh, the superintendent, uh, Pauline uh, Portria, the business manager, and Greg Marles, the director of facilities and maintenance, and myself, the uh, school board finance chair. Um, this is 
the next step in a process that we started uh, you know, three or four years ago by developing a long-term plan, updating the plan, and um, I just want to give everyone an update on uh, where the Building and Grounds Committee stands and uh, the next step. So, uh, slide two. Mm -hmm. um, based on uh, the Building and Grounds uh, internal review and external engineering study that was done, uh, the overall uh, confirmation is that uh, capital improvement needs uh, at the schools, the community services um, department and the pool um, will need to increase. Um, based on internal review and the external study, um, the current facilities or facilities footprint, uh, we believe provides su sufficient capacity to meet student enrollment and community usage projections. That's based on population growth, uh, enrollment trends. Um, item three, and it's very critical that a scheduled asset maintenance and capital investment are needed to sustain the quality of buildings, facilities, and infrastructure. And we'll go into more detail on that. And then the last item, the big bullet point is uh, the scheduled bond retirements that relate to the school um, debt that was issued you know, 20 years ago uh, provide sufficient capital to fund this plan in a, a tax neutral manner. Um, for those in the community that are, are new to uh, this topic, uh, this process um, started uh, three years ago. Most recently, um, the Buildings and Grounds Committee was formed uh, around nine months ago, and there was a direct charge from the school board on delivering certain items, and this is a timeline of the, those deliverables. The first was to do an overall capital improvement projects review and present those findings to the school board. That was done. And on June 18th, uh, that just looked like looked at overall needs um, and didn't look at funding options. Uh, the next uh, obvious item was to look at funding options for the school and community services and pool. The reason we treat those separately is those are different budgets. So you'll have the school budget and then there's a separate budget. Budget for community services and the pool. Um, this report represents our preliminary analysis and recommendations. I just want to highlight whenever you do a long range plan of 10 years, the numbers may change um, in terms of when a project needs to be done. Is it 2017 or 18? And you may have minor changes in estimates, but we're very confident in, in the overall findings and recommendations. Uh, item three, the town council and the school board finance chairs will combine school, community services, and municipal capital needs and present those findings to a joint uh, meeting between the school board and town council. It says in here that'll be September, October. We are more precise than that, so we set an actual date of uh, September 25th. And this is a big uh, step forward for the town of Cape Elizabeth. It will give citizens an overview of all the capital needs for the one town. So in terms of assessing priorities, in terms of assessing needs, we believe all the needs will be laid out for everyone to, to assess. And then finally, after that meeting, the Buildings and Grounds Committee will present a final capital stewardship plan to the school board. And we hope to do that. Uh, won't happen in September. Uh, it'll happen after that meeting. So hopefully in the October time frame, and in this too long a slide, the final bullet point will be the school board will then uh, I'm confident we'll take the necessary next steps to, to implement the plan to make sure the assets at the school, community, community services and pool are, are well maintained. So school CIP overview. Um, this is uh, some school board members have seen this already based on our previous uh, analysis. Uh, 11.8 million in total projected capital improvement projects over 10 years. This is an overview. The Buildings and Grounds Committee would recommend $2.7 million in bond funding. Um, just to highlight, the $2.7 million is less than the $6.1 million that is scheduled to retire over s the next 10 years. So the uh, outstanding bond amount will, will decline. And um, the difference will be funded through an annual school CIP budget and $580,000 in other financing, particularly m municipal lease. Um, so the big picture is, you know, 11.8 million. I want to highlight that's over 10 years. Um, and if you look at the major areas, uh, roof, 
HVAC, which is for heating, ventilation, um, filtration, etc. Structural, uh, that would be built column repairs, brickwork repairs, uh, code modifications, wall replacement. Uh, electrical, that is obviously lighting, but also some pretty significant uh, electrical rerouting. So the overall numbers are 11.8 million. But I think personally, an easier way to think of this is uh, on an annual basis. So 11.8 million for our, our math um, wizards in Cape is uh, one, uh, roughly $1.2 million. And the way I think about it is $1.2 million is approximately 2% of the replacement cost of the assets at the school. So if you look at our insurance report, it makes an assessment what's the replacement cost for all of the facilities at the school. And our annual rate would be 2%, um, which if you look at useful lives, um, et cetera, I think is a, is a very reasonable amount. Um, so that's the top level approach and we'll or later on the slides go through more project specific. Uh, so on slide six, uh, this is titled annual projected CIP need. So the building and grounds committee said, don't worry about the timing, how hard it would be to fund all these in one year based on the studies, based on internal analysis. Ideally, when would you do these projects? So as you notice, there's significant variability from one year it may go to 1 million, the next year it may be 1.5 million. And the reason that's a significant amount to give you a reference point is in our latest budget, the entire net expenditure increase for the schools was $462,000. So if you want to do a project, a single project one year to the next could be greater than the entire net increase in, in the latest report expenditure. So some obvious takeaways are, that would be difficult to fund those year-to-year -year changes through the annual CIP budget. It would create significant volatility in local appropriations and taxes. And um, if the peak to trough in the years would, would provide a lot of, of challenges in terms of scheduling the projects. Um, so slide seven is what we would recommend in terms of a CIP budget. Um, as you can see, there's some uh, peak years, uh, 2016, and it should say 2022, um, and we'll go through this later. But in the peak years, uh, which is the, the, blue, the blue bar is the school recommended CIP, and the red bar is what would be funded through lease and fund projects. So in the big years, that would, the, the red bar would represent funding um, sources other than the annual school budget, such as uh, bonds and leases. Um, it provides a more predictable and more manageable process. Um, if you look at that, your annual CIP budget would be between 850 to a million dollars depending on the year. And we believe it would reduce volatility for the budget, reduce volatility for taxpayers. And more importantly, it would really help position the district to address uh, what we think are very needed um, asset maintenance investments. Um, so slide eight, uh, the, our rationale for recommending school fund bonding. bonding. Uh, one, there's multiple large dollar projects, like I mentioned, um, you know, trying to do a couple $300,000, $500,000 projects in one year would uh, create a lot of volatility for uh, the budget and for tax um, reasons. So. One, we recognize that would be difficult to fund those to the annual CIP budget, and we also think it would reduce annual volatility in taxes. Two, most of these projects are 15 to 20 year lives, and you know, we think prudent stewardship would share the cost of these projects between current taxpayers and future taxpayers. Three, these projects are not discretionary nor expansionary and cannot be deferred. In other words, they, they must be done. And we believe if you do scheduled asset, asset maintenance, it will reduce, uh, you know, difficult, uh, a scenario where you're, you're paying more for a future uh, expenditure than if you had made it on a scheduled basis. And the last item, we believe it provides an opportunity to reduce overall uh, annual tax impact for the school CIP budget. One note of caution, 
the total CIP and debt service expenditure for the school district is less than 8% of the total school budget. So these tax numbers relate to a very small part of the overall budget. With that said, um, if the plan was adopted, the single largest annual tax increase would be 0.15%. The peak year of taxes in 2017 would be 0.02% versus today's current average tax bill. And an easier way uh, to see that, I'll show you in, in a couple slides. Uh, slide nine. Michael? No. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, but somebody reading this, you, you, you stated it correctly, but people have to understand when you say the, in this chart that our tax increase is going to be X and going to go down, that's only the capital improvement portion. Correct. Not, our actual taxes may very well go up quite a bit in that year because of salaries, benefits, all can, these figures in here about tax increases or decreases are solely have to do with the capital improvement plan, not some of these taxes they're going to pay year to year. C correct. And, th and that's okay. why I emphasize that. And it's the same methodology the municipal side's doing. It's the same methodology we'll use in the joint uh, meeting. Um, so it's just highlights for the schools. Even though these, it's an important area, it's less than 8% of the overall school budget. So these tax changes just relate to CIP and related debt service. Uh, page nine, sometimes it's easier to see, well, what are these projects? Um, you know, 2015 uh, middle school boiler plant replacement, 2016 <coughs> roof replacement at the high school, roof replacement at the middle school, roof replacement at Pond Cove, rooftop heating recovering unit replacement, and I, I'm sure everyone can read the other items, um, but like we highlighted, these are not expansionary projects. These are investments that if you make now, um, you reduce the likelihood of higher capital needs um, because you haven't made it what are, 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 are needed investments. Uh, page 10, this represents uh, the capital improvements budget only. Um, this is what would be funded as a, a dollar for dollar through the annual school budget. It excludes the debt service payments. But uh, based on using uh, bond funding, we think it pre creates a predictable uh, amount in the budget. And the reason that's so important is I think if people know and have an idea of future expenditures, it's easier to budget. And hopefully uh, future school boards will stay focused on the, why it's important to fund capital improvements. And if we think if it's at a more predictable, stable amount, it'll be easier um, to understand and fund. Uh, slide 11, so if you add in the CIP and the debt service, um, you know, in 2014, uh, that was already approved, it's $1.7 million. Um, so if you, uh, if our bond recommenda recommendations are uh, approved, um, you know, we think this provides a positive outlook for uh, how variable taxes would be, which is not much, and also um, what could be funded through debt retirement. So when you think of, uh, you know, $1.2 million a year or $11.8 million over 10 years, we think we can do it in a, in a fashion that is uh, manageable and um, has, uh, you know, a positive benefits in terms of predictability. So that's the school side. <coughs> Uh, community services pool, um, as you know, the school board has oversight uh, with the, uh, for the community services and pool budget. I'd also like to highlight there's the advisory commission that we hope uh, to uh, help empower them a little bit more uh, in the future in terms of their goals and responsibilities, but that's uh, another topic. Um, so for community services and pool, it's 2.2 million. Community services is 537,000, pools 1.7 million. The reason we break out the pool, it's a separate building than the community services building. It shares, uh, it's, it's a building space that's shared with the high school. And I believe it also identifies some very specific needs that uh, go along with having a, a pool um, as, a, as a public uh, facility. We recommend a million dollars in bond municipal lease funding the remainder would be funded through the annual community services pool CIP budget. Uh, I think we know the format on, on 13. 
um, you know, there's structural, roof, uh, HVAC, the same categories, and when we provide a final report, you'll even have more detail than you want on all the individual projects, but that gives you an overview. Um, that, that's just for community services of 537,000, and then you look at the pool of 1.7 million. The two big items are roof and HVAC equipment. Um, there's also very pool specific projects you, of heating the water, some other items. Um, it's a wonderful asset that uh, we feel that some investments need to be, to, uh, need to be made to maintain them. Uh, slide 15, it's the same format if we could do it um, you know, if you could do it each year, not worry about volatility, uh, that's what it would look like. It would be difficult to fund through the annual uh, community services CIP budget. Slide 16 um, provides a more predictable roadmap to do this. And I would just highlight uh, when people focus on the numbers that the majority of the needs at the pool and the community services are uh, you know, in 2020 and beyond. So even though there's some significant needs, there's also luckily uh, a time, uh, you know, multiple years to focus on the plan, assess, um, you know, refine the plan if needed. But it would be a mistake not to address these issues um, given how critical community services and the pool is to the community and that there are, are significant capital needs. Um, to, to sustain the programs that have such broad support in, in the community. Uh, 17, the bond rationale is uh, very similar, and I would even argue, given uh, the community services budget, and the, it's much smaller, so the magnitude of a $300,000 project for community services is much greater than if it was for the school or uh, on the municipal side, but it doesn't take away the fact that these are long life projects, roof replacement, HVAC equipment cannot be referred, cannot be deferred. I guess it, you could refer it, I'm not sure about that. But, um, and one thing, if you notice the school, um, you know, that we looked at the school needs and that there's an opportunity to, uh, through prudent management, have it in the years 20 and 21 decline, that would provide some excess flexibility to fund the community services and pool needs that are in 2021. So I'd also like to make a caveat. You know, the tax increase numbers here are just for, um, for uh, capital improvement projects only. Um, and uh, you know, if you look at the single largest annual tax increase would be 0.29%. The peak year would be 0.4%. Um, and we can go into more detail, but 18 lays out what the projects are. I know this is an exciting uh, project, but these are mandatory must-do pool and roof replacement, um, HVAC system replacement, and there's some other very pool-specific needs that are in the budget that won't be bonded um, that will need to be addressed. Uh, so if you look at slide 19, this is only if you did it through this is CIP only. It represents, it doesn't include debt service. Slide 20 is the tax impact. And here's a critical point. This assumes no community services pool user fee increases. Um, it's another discussion as a community we need to have in terms of uh, funding, you know, the fee versus subsidization at community services and pool. So the tax impact could be lower um, based on, you know, fee changes, just as the tax impact could be lower based on energy savings. Those are too, predict too challenging to predict at, at this point. Um, so this is kind of taking the most conservative assumption, um, laying that out. And then the last slide in summary, um, I think this is our fourth meeting. Um, I know Greg's, as a school board discussing this, I know the facilities directors put in 400 plus hours on this project. Uh, the Buildings and Grounds Committee has met, uh, I think, five or six times and uh, several 
hundred Excel spreadsheets back and forth. We've looked at hundreds of pages of external studies. We've looked at insurance reports, top-down and bottoms-up analysis. We've looked at every single project that's included in this analysis, and we're very confident that the capital needs are clear, and more importantly, they're required. These aren't expansionary projects. These are roof replacements. Uh, equipment replacements, structural replacements, code uh, related that ha have to be done. Um, second point is we know there's broad stakeholder use of, of the facilities in Cape Elizabeth, pool, community services, uh, the school, obviously on the municipal side there's library, town hall, uh, the transfer station, the trails of Cape Elizabeth. If you have a car, I assume you use our roads. Um, so there are widely used facilities. Um, and the last point, uh, we think there's a clear path to largely a tax neutral impact through sustained annual CIP budgeting and new bond funding uh, recommendations. So I apologize for the length of the presentation, but it's very important. I think all stakeholders realize the, not only do we have uh, increasing capital needs, but there's also a path to implementing and meeting and sustaining our assets uh, in a prudent way, uh, which minimizes uh, tax volatility, but more importantly, um, make sure we take care of the assets uh, that we have in place and aren't looking up in you know, eight to 10 years and having um, you know, significant capital increases when um, you know, bond funding availability and interest rates may, may not be as f favorable. So for the school board, um, the next step, uh, you know, I would say, obviously you can ask questions. Uh, we're not asking you to approve this. We'll have a final report after we have the joint uh, town council and school board meeting. Uh, it'll include next steps in terms of um, bond recommendation, next steps, other analysis the Building Grounds Committee will do. Um, so there's a lot of material here, but I just want to let every, take away on the school side, you know, if you look at our total uh, assets, the replacement cost, the total annual amount for the schools is roughly, uh, roughly around 2%. For community services pool, it's higher at, at 4%, um, and that's because of the, the specific needs in the pool, uh, but we think all these assets can be maintained, uh, but we definitely recommend considering bonding as a way to make sure these investments uh, are made in, in a prudent fashion. Uh, questions? Thank you, Michael. David. I, I'm sorry I wasn't there for the school board business meeting where we discussed this, but I, I think it was an excellent presentation. I'm, I'm stunned that the analysis that went into this, um, having doing this, having been involved in financing for most of my career, this is I wish I had something this good in any case I ever had. I still have a couple of questions or things I, um, and I'm in no particular order. I, I thought I heard you say that there was a possibility of uh, school funds being used in later years for, for community services? Uh, no, the, the, the budgets are separately, but if you looked at the graph of the school where the tax impact um, in the later years declines, that's due to bond retirements. Um, but we looked at also the needs of the community service and pool where in 2021, that's where there's some significant need. Right. So they're separate budgets, but we wanted to be mindful that, you know, um, you know there's a, a path to, to make it easier on the taxpayer. That, that's a path we should but, choose. So. And I just want to ask But they are totally separate budgets. And, and that path is a possible one, but what, there may be other needs for the schools that that money may not be available 10, 12, 14 years from now. Yes, um, correct. That was the point I wanted to make. Uh, also, um, I'm fascinated by the fact, and I guess I would be in a um, the sky is always falling type of lawyer. Um, when you articulate it's a clear path to a tax neutral impact, uh, th that is a, a projection, and that could be affected by different events, different interest rates. We are in no way guaranteeing that this will always be uh, a tax neutral impact. Any particular year it could have one, any particular years it might not. I don't want anybody to get the impression that we're selling this that it's tax neutral because it could very well not be. 
Correct, but I also I agree that it's not, but I think a big focus on doing this and laying out all the needs as one town is so stakeholders can make decisions on, you know, what are the overall needs. That's why uh, we're highlighting that this is represents less than 7% of the school budget. I, I agree with that. I just, again, I just like people tend to latch on to a phrase out of context, and I want to make sure that that phrase isn't taken out of context. So I had one more. Um, I think, as analyze this as best I can, is it, and you can correct me, but one of the ways we're able to do this with, with, with um, no uh, projection of no significant tax increases is the fact that we're using debt retirement, savings that would normally go towards bonds that we are retiring in the school side towards funding capital improvements. In fact, the largest portion is that savings is being used to fund it. So we actually, there's been discussions about availability of, of funds um, as a result of school bonds being retired. The reality is we need it all to be able to fund the capital improvements without impacting the taxes. Is that long statement fair? Uh, yes, uh, th that is uh, correct. If if you look at the different sources of it, the, the, the amount of bonds retiring um, are, I believe I said $8 million if you look at the incremental. So there's, it's not, we're not uh, doing, uh, recommending $8 million in bonding, so a portion of it um, provides savings so you can fund it through the annual uh, CIP budget. But you're, you're correct in your clarification or Characterization that that, was, that is the scenario. It was just a comment for the public to know. Meredith, did you have something? Just, to add? just briefly. I mean, thank you to Michael and to Pauline and Greg and Russell as well for for their work on on this project. But I think that this piece reflects a really significant work on the part of the board to be really proactive about taking care of the district's facilities, and that that is really important work. If you look at the difference from where we've been spending, you know, less than a quarter of a million dollars a year to maintain our facilities, this is showing to me, and I think, you know, clearly your message to the taxpayers is that we have resources that need to be taken care of. Um, but I think the work that you have done is not only about the facilities, but, you know, I, I think this board is really taking proactive steps in policy and in, you know, um, budget and in strategic planning. So I, again, I just think you should give yourself some credit for the work because it's not just in this area, but it really is across the board. So. Could I make one more point, Michael? Um, I, these are projections, and it's a great job, and I'm going to ride this horse one more time through this room, and that is that any given year, they may not match up. And this is, again, a pitch that one of the ways we, since we only collect our taxes or we only do our budget once a year, we're going to have to think during this time period, since we're funding a lot of it through the cash flow of tax revenue that we create reserves to cover us, because we're only taking two bonds at two different times, and we have to make it all up, all rest up from tax revenue, we would be prudent to make sure we have adequate reserves for things that just don't go right. Yeah, David, I think that the, in the past, um, citizens, taxpayers have asked, asked the board to be more proactive, uh, or, or more, um, more proactive in terms of doing long-term financial planning. Um, and, and this, you know, this look, 10 year look at facilities, it will never tie um, future school boards to specific spending decisions that we're making, you know, we would be making today. Um, but it is a plan, it's a, it's a context and a structure within which um, future school boards can work and, and, and address facilities needs. That's not my concern. I think that's absolutely prudent. It would be nonsensical to do it any other way. What I'm simply saying is, to put, is from an economic perspective, it makes some sense because we're relying on a stable source of revenue and there could be a massive expense in one year that we weren't anticipating. We can only collect our money once that we should be building up our reserves to take care of those possible hiccups. Not that, I'm not in any way saying we don't plan for 10, 15 years. It's the only way you can fund something like this. Are there any other comments or questions for Michael? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. This is, I want to.
just repeat it's excellent work. Mm -hmm. um, and I know work. Pauline, <coughs> and Greg, and Russell, have, and all, you have all done a lot of work on this. And we have to get. Did you say? Did you say Greg? Good. I did. Because I was about to say it. I did. I did. He did a lot um, of work on this as well, Greg Miles. So, thank you again. Um, and on to item eight, school board agenda requests. Are there any requests for future agenda items? No. Um, so on to item nine, announcement of future meetings. I passed out um, a schedule and Andrea Fuller sent out a calendar earlier today so that we had a better look at the fall schedule. Um, but upcoming meetings include our um, workshop on, on uh, is that right, Tuesday, Tuesday September 24th, um, followed by the joint uh, meeting that Michael mentioned with the town council on Wednesday, September 25th, to talk about capital planning. And the audit report. And the town audit report. Um, and then um, is on that third, full school board and town council. That's is full. That is the full board, and the, yes, yes. We hope the whole board will be there, and, and uh, if people can let me know about that date, that would be great. Um, and if you could also let me know about Thursday, October third, which is a proposed date in the morning for a retreat with the district leadership team. I have a question about that. How long do you think that meeting might? Seven thirty a.m. to ten thirty a.m. Um, and then um, after that, I guess the only things I, other thing that I would point out about this schedule here is that is would be the workshop schedule. So the September workshop agenda is the strategic plan and some discussion of change planning. And by that, do you mean our possible discussion of a change policy? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, bro I, bro I guess I use planning as opposed to policy, just to broaden the scope of that conversation a little bit. But there may be a policy that results, if that's the best way forward. Uh, and then the October workshop uh, w will address substance issues. Um, and the November workshop, the achievement gap um, conversation. So those are the workshop agendas for the fall, right at this point, and that's what I have in terms of upcoming meetings. Does anyone else have upcoming meetings? Can I announce the uh, next library, town council library meeting? Yes. That is held on the 20th, September 20th at 9 o'clock. And check on the library website, um, library town council website for where. Most of the time it's at the library. Sometimes it does have to be moved to the town, um, police station. Um, but they're great meetings. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and on to item 10. May I have a motion? I move that we adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you all.